Hi, everybody. Welcome back to Patriots History. Um, I'm Larry Swikart, co-author Patriots History of the United States, and your host for this show. Let me remind you as we go out here, start off, that um, at the website, we have our Black Friday offers up now. And it's three different book packages. <clears throat> Some contain Patriots History, Dragon Slayers, uh, my autobiography, a whole host of new books, some of them you haven't seen before. So take a look. Remember, if you want to give them as Christmas gifts, it takes a while to order them from the publisher, sign them, and ship them to you. So uh, make sure you get your orders in right away. Also, if you're watching this and you want more in-depth history, go to the Wild World of History and join the VIP. Uh, it's got 40 hours on my Wild Wednesday webcast on a variety of historical topics from Hitler to UFOs in history to the American Revolution to the economy. I mean, all sorts of stuff. And uh, it's got six ongoing lesson programs, including Reagan, the American president, the 1619 project called the 1620 default. And uh, the newest one is Integrity, Winston Churchill. Or if you're into politics, go over to the wild world of politics and join the insider. You also get six ongoing lesson programs, including the new one, which isn't available at Wild World of History, which is Globalism Then and Now, taken from my forthcoming book, Patriots History of Globalism, out next February. Also a reminder, oh yeah, we can give these also as gifts if you want to give a subscription as a gift. I need to know the email, though, the person you're giving it to, not just your email, okay? Uh, reminder also, I will be on all two hours of Steve Bannon's Thanksgiving program this Thanksgiving. Uh, so make sure you check that out. Okay, we are in Chapter 6, The Perils and Promise of Jackson's America. And uh, as always, I'm reading from the 15th Anniversary Edition I do have a 20th anniversary edition that will go from 2018 to the present and will also have all sorts of a new material, not a lot of revisions, but a lot of new material inserted in the text. It will be free. I will get it up on the website sometime next year. Uh, so make sure you look for that. Uh, we don't want it to compete with Patriots History of Globalism, but it'll be out there soon. Also, remember, I will be attending... Uh, all five great homeschool conventions in Greenville, South Carolina, St. Louis, Missouri, Cincinnati, Ohio, Austin, Texas, and Ontario, California, as well as the um, Call to Teach uh, Texas Homeschool Convention, the Florida Parent uh, Homeschool Convention in Orlando. And we're still looking at a way to try to do uh, Arizona Homeschool Convention with um, someone who can do that for me while I'm in Texas. So we'll see how that works. Um, is that it? Yeah. Oh, if you haven't tuned in to my today's news at uncoverdc.com, five days a week, it's free. It's the best five to seven minute news summary you're ever going to hear with some stuff you won't hear anywhere else. All right, let's get started again. We're with the 15th anniversary of the Patriots History of the United States. And I am on <clears throat> page 219 with Andrew Jackson, Indian fighter. Let me check some. Yes, I thought this was the case. It seemed to me that we had an insertion here before we do this section. This actually goes on page 215. Um, in a new paragraph that we would insert after the one ending his administration. So it is this. One more remarkable aspect of the election of 1824 requires attention. The nation overwhelmingly still saw itself as governed locally, not nationally. In the presidential election where John Quincy Adams was a favorite son, the presidential vote came to 37,000, the previous year, 66,000 had voted in a governor's race. Uh, Ohio's governor's election earlier in the autumn of 1824 had a turnout of 76,000, contrasted with only 59,000 that turned out in the presidential election. 
Virginia, with a white population numbering 625,000, saw only 15,000 votes cast for president. Pennsylvania, with a population of a million, only 47,000. This is all from Paul Johnson's book, Birth of the Modern. Nor were politics nicer or less poisonous at the time. Uh, quite the contrary, a disagreement in 1837 over the use of wolf pelts as currency in Arkansas left a state representative dead on the floor of the state general assembly at the hands of the Speaker of the House, who used a large knife to kill his opponent. This is the Wilson-Anthony duel from the Encyclopedia of Arkansas. Even, presidential, uh, even President James Monroe nearly fought William Crawford, a presidential candidate, inside the presidential residence. As matters grew more heated, Crawford raised his cane and shouted at Monroe, you damned infernal old scoundrel, to which the president grabbed some tongs from the fireplace and after an appropriate epithet of his own, warned he would ring for servants and have Crawford removed from the White House. Again, this is from Johnson's Birth of the Modern. Even in subsequent decades, senators bore arms in the Senate chamber, and of course, Congressman Preston Brooks beat Senator Charles Sumner nearly to death with a cane in 1856. <laughs> More civil indeed. All right, so we are back to page 219. That would have gone on page 215. Andrew Jackson, Indian fighter. For several generations, Europeans had encroached on Indian lands and, through a process of treaties and outright confiscation through war, steadily acquired more land to the West. Several alternative policies had been attempted by the United States government in its dealings with the Indians. One emphasized the nationhood of the tribe and sought to conduct foreign policy of the Indian tribes the way the United States would deal with a European power. Another, more frequent process involved exchanging treaty promises and goods for Indian land in an attempt to keep the races separate. But the continuous flow of settlers, first into the Ohio and Mohawk Valleys, then into the backwoods of the Carolinas, Kentucky, Georgia, and Alabama, caused the treaties to be broken, usually by whites, almost as soon as the signatures were affixed. Uh, another problem with these kinds of treaties that set land boundaries is that Indians did not recognize land boundaries. They didn't think that you could own land. So it's just, it's a cultural problem that could not be overcome. Andrew Jackson had a typically Western attitude toward Indians respecting their fighting ability while nonetheless viewing them as savages who possess no inherent rights. Old Hickory's campaigns in the Creek and Seminole Wars made clear his willingness to use force to move Indians from their territories. When Jackson was elected, he announced, quote, a just, humane, and liberal policy that would remove the Indians west of the Mississippi River, a proposal that itself merely copied previous suggestions by John C. Calhoun, James Monroe, and others. Jackson's removal bill floundered, however, barely passing the House. National Republicans fought it on the grounds that, quote, legislative government was the very essence of republicanism, whereas Jackson represented executive government, which ultimately led to uh, despotism, and they were right. Put another way, Indian removal exemplified the myth of the Jacksonian Democrats as the party of small government. No wonder the Jacksonians wanted their opponents' power and influence shrunk, but that never seemed to translate into actual reductions in Jackson's autonomy. In 1825, a group of Creek Indians agreed to a treaty to turn over their land to the state of Georgia, but a tribal council quickly repudiated the treaty as unrepresentative of all the Creek. One problem lay in the fact that whites often did not know which chiefs, indeed, spoke for the whole nation. Therefore, whichever one best fit the settlers' plan was the one that, represented, that representatives tended to accept as, quote, legitimate. Before the end of the year, troops from Georgia had forced the creek out. A more favorable obstacle, formidable obstacle, the Cherokee, held significant land in Tennessee, Georgia, Mississippi, and Alabama. 
the Cherokee had written had a written constitution, representative government, newspapers, and it always epitomized the civilization many whites claimed they wanted the tribes to achieve. But the Cherokee also had sided with the British in the Revolutionary War and had attacked settlements in Georgia and the Carolinas on the frontier, while the British worked inland from the coast. Jackson, like many in North Carolina, harbored a grudge against the tribe he felt had stabbed the patriots in the back, and to some extent saw, um, saw an opportunity to settle an old score. Land hunger again drove the state of Georgia to try to evict the tribe, which implored Jackson for help. This time, Jackson claimed that states were sovereign over the people within their borders and refused to intervene on their behalf. Yet his supporters then drafted a thoroughly interventionist removal bill. In other words, if, uh, if they're fighting Georgia, then he says, oh, the states have all the power. And if he wants to remove them, he says, oh, the federal government has all the power. Very hypocritical and devious. Yet his supporters then drafted a thoroughly interventionist removal bill called by Jackson's most sympathetic biographer, quote, harsh, arrogant, and racist, unquote, passed in 1830 with the final version encapsulating Jackson's basic assumptions about the Indians. The bill discounted the notion that Indians had any rights whatsoever, certainly not treaty rights, and stated that the government not only had that authority, but the duty to relocate Indians whenever it pleased. In fact, the removal bill did not authorize unilateral abrogation of the treaties nor forced relocation. Jackson personally exceeded congressional authority to displace the natives. This guy did not like Indians. Jackson supporters repeatedly promised any relocation would be, quote, free and voluntary to enforce the removal. The president had the right, had to ride, I'm sorry, and to enforce the removal, the president had to ride roughshod over Congress. Faced with such reality, some Cherokees accepted the fate of Georgia's offer of $65, $68 million and 32 million acres of land. Oh, oh man, I'm having trouble. Let me start this one again. Faced with such reality, some Cherokee accepted the state of Georgia's offer of $68 million and 32 million acres of land west of the Mississippi for a hundred missionaries of Georgia land. I'm having real trouble today. One more time. Faced with such reality, some Cherokee accepted the state of Georgia's offer of 68 million and 32 million acres of land west of the Mississippi for 100 million acres of Georgia land. In other words, $68 million and 32 million acres in return for 100 million acres of Georgia land. I don't know why I'm having such trouble with this today. Others, however, with the help of two New England missionaries who deliberately violated Georgia law to bring the case to trial, filed appeals in the federal court system. In 1831, the Cherokee Nation v. Georgia reached the United States Supreme Court wherein the Cherokee claimed their status as a sovereign nation subject to similar treatment under treaty as foreign states. The Supreme Court, led by Chief Justice Marshall, rejected the Cherokee definition of sovereign nation based on the fact they resided entirely within the borders of the United States. However, he and other court members strongly implied that they would hear a challenge to Georgia's law on other grounds particularly the state's violation of federal treaty powers under the Constitution. So Marshall says, you, you can't argue it this way. We can't accept an argument that runs along these lines. But if you argue it this way, we will hear, hear your case, meaning almost certainly we will side with you. The subsequent case, Wooster v. Georgia, 1832, resulted in a different ruling. Marshall's court stated that Georgia could not violate Cherokee land rights because those rights were protected under the jurisdiction of the federal government. Jackson muttered, John Marshall has made his decision, now let him enforce it, and proceeded to ignore the Supreme Court's ruling. Ultimately, the Cherokee learned that having the highest court in the land, even Congress on their side, 
meant little to a president who disregarded the rule of law and the sovereignty of the states when it suited him. I don't know why people are so, especially conservatives, are so enamored of Jackson. This guy was a dictator and a tyrant in almost every way. He was against the free market. He was against states' rights. He was against almost everything you can think of that conservatives should be for. In 1838, General Winfield Scott arrived with an army and demanded that, quote, immigration must be commenced in haste, but without disorder. And he implored the Cherokee not to resist. Cherokee Chief John Ross continued to appeal to Washington right up to the moment he left camp, quote, have we done anything wrong? We are not charged with any. We have a country in which others covet. This is the offense we have ever yet been charged with, unquote. Ross's entities fell on deaf ears. Scott pushed more than 12,000 Cherokee along the Trail of Tears uh, toward Oklahoma, which was designated Indian Territory, a journey which 3,000 Indians died of starvation or disease along the way. Vis visitors who came in contact with the traveling Cherokee learned that, quote, the Indians buried 14 or 15 at every stopping place. Nevertheless, the bureaucracy in Jackson was satisfied. The commissioner on Indian affairs in his 1839 report astonishingly called the episode, quote, a striking example of liberality of the government, man. Claiming that, quote, good feeling has been preserved and we have quietly and gent gently quietly and gently killing 3,000, transported 18,000 Indian friends to the West Bank of the Mississippi. That was our emphasis in the book. From the Indians' perspective, the obvious maxim with friends like these, <laughs> who needs enemies, no doubt came to mind. But from another perspective, the Cherokee, despite the horrendous costs they paid and in the Civil War, when the tribe, like the nation, had warriors fighting on both sides, ultimately triumphed. They survived and prospered, commemorating their trail of tears and their refusal to be victims. Other Indian tribes relocated or were crushed. When Jackson attempted to remove Chief Black Hawk and the Sauk and Fox Indians in Illinois, Black Hawk resisted. The Illinois militia pursued the Indians into Wisconsin Territory, where at Bad Axe, they utterly destroyed the warriors and slaughtered women and children as well. The Seminole in Florida also staged a campaign of resistance that took nearly a decade to quell and ended only when Osceola, the Seminole, Seminole chief, was treacherously captured under the auspices of a white flag in 1837. It would be several decades before the Eastern tribes began to reassess their treatment of the Indians. I'm sorry. I, my mind must be mush today. It would be several decades before Eastern whites would begin to reassess their treatment of the Indians with any remorse or taint of conscience. So for anyone who says that Patriots history of the United States, oh, it, it, it's all just, it covers over all the blemishes and it doesn't talk about the bad stuff. We clearly discuss America's sinful treatment of the Indians right here. We go into detail. By the way, in that uh, Black Hawk War in Illinois, both Abraham Lincoln and Jefferson Davis, I should add, and Stephen Douglas all served and uh, Lincoln didn't serve much at all. He had, um, I think he said he had a war wound, which was a mosquito bit him. He joked about it. So for those today, and I'm not disparaging veterans in any way, shape, or form, but for those who today who insist that, well, Trump never served. Well, Jefferson never served. Lincoln barely served. Um, military service is great. It's wonderful. I respect it. Hats off to those who serve. But it doesn't mean you're necessarily qualified to be governor, president, or whatever. Uh, it, it's, it's something that people did. And in the past, they did it much more frequently than they do today. Okay. 
I'm going to end that here. I will be back on Friday. And then I'm going to take all next week off. Uh, Thanksgiving week, I will be on Steve Bannon's War Room on Thanksgiving Day um, for two hours. And uh, so keep that in mind. I hope you join me there. We, um, we'll have a great time talking about all sorts of stuff. Um, I, I plan to talk about the Civil War a little bit and Lincoln's Thanksgiving message. So check that out. And I will be back here on Friday with another episode of Patriots History.